Representative Ziegler, he's having trouble finding it. I can resend it to him. We're also live now. Just letting everyone know. Okay. So is Representative Ziegler the only one who we know is trying to get on to the hearing? Only member? Does anybody else know of anyone? Okay. So Jordan will uh, resend the link to uh, Representative Ziegler. There he is, all the way from his energy conference in Colorado. Um, so he'll be joining us in a minute. But we are with the uh, Joint Standing Committee on Energy, Utilities, and uh, Technology. I am State Senator Mark Lawrence. I am the Senate Chair of the committee. And I just asked uh, the House Chair to introduce himself, Representative Barry. Good morning. My name is Seth Barry. I represent House District 55, which is Bowdoin, Bowdoinham, almost all of Richmond, and beautiful Swan Island on the Kennebec. Great. And then I'm going to go around and ask each of the individual uh, committee members to introduce themselves. Uh, Representative Wadsworth. Good morning, everyone. My name is Nathan Wadsworth, and I represent House District 70, Hiram Porter, Brownfield, Freiburg, and Lovell. Nice to see everybody. Representative Grahowski. Good morning, Representative Nicole Grahowski. I serve House District 132, the city of Ellsworth and town of Trenton. Senator Vitelli. Good morning. I'm Eloise Vitelli. I represent Senate District 23, which is all of Sagadoc County the town of Dresden in Lincoln County, and I live in the island community of Arousic, right next to Georgetown, by the way. And she's coming live to us from one of her local car dealerships. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> you can see that. Senator Cuddy. Good morning, my name is Scott Cuddy. I live in Winterport and I represent House District 98, which is Winterport, Frankfort, Searsport, and Swanville. Senator Foster. Good morning, I'm Steve Foster, a representative for District 104, including the towns of Dexter, Charleston, Exeter, Stetson, and Garland. Representative Wood. Good morning, I'm Barb Wood, and I represent House District 38, which is the western end of the peninsula in Portland. Representative Carlo. Hi there, uh, Representative Nathan Carlo. Uh, don't worry, I have my my little cousin who is acting as my assistant today in the car, so he's pushing all the buttons. I represent House District 16, which is all of all of Paula's part of Buxton and a part of Saka. And it's really good to see you guys again this morning. Continue. Great, Representative Ziegler. Good morning, I'm Representative Paige Ziegler. I represent District 96 in Waldo County, the seven towns of Belmont, Liberty, Lincolnville, Mountville, Morrill, Palermo, and Searsmont, and also right now, Breckenridge, Colorado. <laughs> Great, Representative Kessler, are you there? Yes, I am. Uh, I'm unable to turn on the video, but I'm uh, Chris Kessler. I represent District 32, which is a part of South Portland and a little smidgen of Cape Elizabeth. Okay, so uh, everybody knows video will have to be on for voting. Um, so if you're unable to do it, Representative Kessler, um, you wouldn't be able to vote today, but we'll have you on for as long as we can. And if you can figure out how to get on for video for the voting, that would be great. Um, and I'm going to ask our clerk. I'm going to ask our clerk, Jordan Merrifield, to introduce himself. My name is Jordan Merrifield. I'm the clerk. I've been called back here to, to help out today. And it's nice to see everyone. And we missed you. And, and by the way, just when all of you thought you were safe from having another Zoom legislative hearing, we're back again. So uh, hopefully this may be one of our last uh, Zoom legislative hearings. So this is a public hearing of the Joint Standing Committee on Energy Utilities and Technology for the purposes of considering the nomination by the governor of Carlos Javier Barrio Nuevo of Georgetown, and I hope I pronounced that right, Carlos, uh, for appointment to the Maine Connectivity Authority. 
Under the laws and joint rules of the legislature, this committee is required to hold this public hearing and to recommend confirmation or denial of the nominee by a majority vote of the committee members present and voting. As chairs of the committee, Representative Barry and I will then send written notice to the of the committee's recommendations to the president of the Senate. The committee will hear testimony from and have the opportunity to question the governor or her representative, the nominee and any other persons present who wish to speak for or against the nomination. This meeting is currently being live streamed on the committee's YouTube channel. This means that anyone who is a participant in the meeting via Zoom can be seen and also heard if their microphone is unmuted. People testifying cannot be seen or heard until they are called upon to speak. This meeting will be recorded and available to view on the committee's YouTube channel soon after the meeting has been concluded. Pursuant to Title III, Section 157 of the main statutes, which requires that there be an affirmative motion to recommend the confirmation of the nominee, the chair recognizes Representative Barry for the purposes of making such a motion. Representative Barry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and Representative Barry is fluent in Spanish, so he's going to be much better on the name than I am. Yes, and I, I cannot always uh, be certain that someone wishes to have the R rolled, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, Mr. Chair, I move that the Joint Standing Committee on Energy, Utilities, and Technology recommend confirmation of Mr. Carlos Javier Barrio Nuevo of Georgetown for appointment to the Maine Connectivity Authority. Great, thank you. A copy of the uh, statutory requirements for this pos position is available on the committee's website. Uh, the chair now recognizes uh, Commissioner Heather Johnson for the purposes of making a statement concerning this nomination. Heather? Great, thank you, Senator. Uh, Senator Lawrence, Representative Barry, and distinguished members of the Joint Standing Committee on Energy, Utilities, and Technology. My name is Heather Johnson, and I'm the Commissioner of the Maine Department of Economic and Community Development. The Maine Connectivity Authority was established through emergency legislation and signed into law by the governor in June. The authority is charged with ensuring the universal availability of high-speed connectivity and secure, affordable, reliable, and sustainable communications to meet the state's needs now and into the future. There were seven members to be appointed, and they are as follows. Three members who possess expertise in advanced communications, technology, infrastructure, or communication services. One member representing communities in the state. One member who possesses expertise in banking or financial lending one member who possesses expertise in education system needs, and one member who possesses expertise in telehealth delivery and telehealth system needs. We're very fortunate in Maine as, we've had, as we have hundreds of qualified and really interested people who work on broadband across the state. And while there will be many avenues for people to engage and support this ongoing work, the governor has selected seven people as the initial Maine Connectivity Board. I'm honored to be here this morning to speak in support of the main connectivity authority appointments on behalf of the governor. The first nominee this morning is Carlos Orenuevo of Georgetown. Carlos is a graduate of the University of Chicago and the University of Rochester's Simon School of Business Administration with an MBA in finance and corporate accounting. Since receiving his MBA, he's had a long and varied business career that will serve him well on the authority, including roles as senior director of business development for NPR, the principal of media and technology firm of OVO Solutions, and senior director of Palisades Media Ventures, where he's responsible for developing media partnerships and digital video distribution strategies. Currently, Carlos is the owner of Robin Hood Free Meeting House, a historic events center in Midcoast, Maine, and the director of Public Media Company, a nonprofit consulting company dedicated to improving public media. Additionally, he is the managing member of Georgetown Broadband LLC, which is building a community funded fiber to the home network to connect Georgetown with best of breed fiber service. Carlos's extensive business experience and work with his community broadband project will make him a valuable member of the main connectivity authority 
And on behalf of Governor Mills, I urge you to support his nomination. I would be happy to answer any questions. Great, Commissioner, we'll start off. I'll start off with one simple question first. If you could, as each nominee gets uh, up, if you could identify which criteria they're filling. And also my understanding is some of these terms are staggered. And if this is a staggered term, if you could identify uh, what the term is. Okay, thank you, Senator. That, yes, there are staggered terms. This would be a three-year term and would be the um, community representative selection. Great. I don't know if I took away Representative Grahowski's question. I did. Um, so we'll go on. Are there any other questions for the uh, governor's uh, representative? Questions? Representative Foster? Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, and thank you, uh, thank you, Commissioner Johnson, for appearing here today. Uh, I have a concern with, well, actually, many of these nominees on uh, what I understood was supposedly going to represent the entire state of Maine, especially rural communities, uh, and uh, in particular, this gentleman's position is uh, on the uh, board would be that uh, fill that slot. Uh, representing the communities in Maine. Uh, I know through what I've heard here and also emails I've received that there's concern out there with other parts of the state, especially uh, those areas in central Maine and, and north of me, that uh, we have chosen someone from uh, the coast and, and the southern part of the state to be this, to fill this position. So uh, I'll, I'll voice that concern. I have the same concern with uh, the overall makeup of this uh, of this nominee's uh, slate for the for the board but I, I guess I would ask uh, were there not any other nominees or, or candidates if you will considered uh, who have been in the state and involved with uh, trying to get broadband uh, out to the rural parts of the state uh, that were uh, considered thank you Senator, can I is Go ahead okay? and respond, yes. Yes, thank you. Representative Foster, thank you for the question. And, you know, certainly there are a lot of people who represent lots of different perspectives as it relates to this work. Um, you know, as we talk to a lot of communities, right, they are at all different stages. I will say Carlos was selected for a variety of reasons. One of them is he has was at the very beginning with this Georgetown broadband work. Um, it was not an easy process and has for years navigated that process to get it to completion. And so it is a successful kind of project and has learned a lot through that process. And so we feel confident that he understands and has lived that process day to day, um, which is really important. Uh, additionally, certainly we are trying to look at um, people who would have a broader vision for um, multiple models, right? There's no one model that will meet all of these needs. And so what we tried to do is put together um, a group that can look across the state and, and come up with ideas, come up with priorities, remove large barriers. Um, but certainly these seven folks, while we see them as incredibly qualified, won't be the only people influencing the work of the Main Connectivity Authority, right? There will be advisory groups. There's a lot of work that will be done. Um, we actually are have an advisory group that's been working on standing up ideas and processes for the main connectivity authority. That is an open group. Anybody can join that chooses to. Um, and so we have a, a number of folks there as well that are very focused on community broadband and maybe not on other aspects. So I think we will try to balance some of those edges of the spectrum as well. Thank you, Commissioner. Are there other questions? Representative Foster, did you have a follow-up? Yes, uh, thank you, Senator Lawrence. So I understand there are many other people in the state that have similar experience in trying to get broadband uh, into their areas, but my question was, were any of those folks considered or, uh, in filling this slot? Thank you. So yes, a lot of folks were considered. The only other, we only have a handful of other places that have done municipal broadband. Islesboro is one of them. Um, and obviously that was done at a consultant level and with a really different tax base than 
what is representative of kind of what we expect most of these projects to look like. Um, Callis and Baileyville is another one, right? That is that is up and running um, and is currently expanding. So there aren't a lot of other places where we've seen this get all the way to completion. Swans Island is another place where they've done that, um, but again, did it a different a different way. So there certainly are choices, Representative Foster, and we will make sure that people are at the table as we're making these decisions. Are you all set, Representative Foster? Representative Grohowski? Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Commissioner, for being here uh, this morning with us. And um, I don't want to take this off topic per se, but um, I was interested in your answer to that because I do share Representative Foster's concerns about the geographic makeup. I, I feel that people that live in my region and much farther north and much farther east, which is a good portion of the state, will look at this board and uh, not necessarily see their needs reflected. Um, but I, I do think that the nominees probably have a priority to see that all of Maine gets connected because that is how the state will thrive. Um, but you mentioned the advisory group that's formed that sounds like it's somewhat ad hoc. Could you just talk to us about how um, the public has been notified about that group and how they might participate? I know that probably there will be people interested who are watching this and I too would be interested because I know I have some constituents who might want to participate in that. Yeah, so there are a number of a pass that we tried to notify people. And, and I think certainly Representative Grahowski, we continue to, we'll continue to do that and it will continue to spread, right? I think that we tend to have, um, we tend to have challenges getting word out as broadly as we'd like to. We know the main broadband coalition communicated the advisory meetings and how to kind of join into that and has done output from the advisory groups as well. We did it to kind of all interested parties from the Connect Maine Authority, um, we reached out to other economic development groups as well to make sure that they were involved. Um, the Maine Broadband Coalition and I recently did an event at, with uh, with an Arusic group that's getting stood up and trying to figure out how to get help and get started. So um, we have a broad group, but I do think as this board gets stood up and as a president is selected over the course of time, that that will there will be a an option, right, for them to, to figure out what are these advisory committees look like. MTI, the Main Technology Institute, actually has a really good structure of a board and then a number of advisory groups to advise on specific areas. And that's a model that, that I hope MCA will look at as they continue to expand, right? I, I do think we have a lot of people that want to weigh in here. This is incredibly important work. Um, and we've never had, right, this kind of opportunity to do this work in this way. So I think between um, all of those pieces, we will create platforms for, for that engagement. Other questions? Representative Berry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, thank you, Commissioner, uh, for your, your um, quick, very quick work in, in um, putting the slate of nominees together. So, um, just for clarity, um, was there a was there any sort of um, opportunity to to um, to apply? Was there any public notice given about the opportunity to, um, to 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 put one's name forward for nomination? Um, we did have people who put their names forward. They were included in the package that went to the governor for selection. Um, mm -hmm. We generally give multiple options for each position. Um, for the governor and her team's review. And that, uh, I think I saw Joe on earlier, obviously the director of boards and commissions, Missy O'Neill does that work and has done that successfully over the course of the last few years. Um, so yes, there was opportunity for that. It was clear in the statute for people who are engaged with this work that that board would be nominated and set up and needed to be confirmed. And so, yes, we talked about that multiple times at the advisory group, um, so there was an opportunity for four names to be submitted. Yes. But not a, not a public um, listing or, or notice. And I don't think that that's normally required. It certainly wasn't required in the statute. I just wanted to be clear about that. Um, I, I should defer to Joe. I think he's on, but there is a, there's a standard public notice period. We did meet that standard. Got it. Um, and a follow-up if I may, Mr. Chair. Go ahead, Representative Barry. Great. 
Um, Mr. Barrionuevo, as you said, um, you know, has a direct experience with uh, community broadband and, and you know, I, I, I find that to be um, very helpful. Um, it's something that the Broadband Caucus uh, spoke about at, at length. Um, as you know, I'm the, um, one of the four co-chairs of the Broadband Caucus and, and there was a great deal of excitement uh, within that bipartisan, nonpartisan group around um, community broadband, municipal broadband, uh, that's that, uh, that kind of approach to things. Um, it is, so, and, and, I, and I apologize if I, I may have missed something in reviewing the, the different submissions, but is, is Mr. Baranuevo the, um, the, the only member uh, that, that's being put forward by the administration that, that has direct experience in that or are there others as well? So, I would say that has executed community broadband, mm -hmm. he would be the only one. Others certainly understand the model and have ad advocated aggressively for the model in the past for communities that are interested. Um, I, what we tried to select in this, um, with these appointees are people that have really good vision and understanding of the market and what's available and an ability to understand different financial models. Because while there are some really active and, and um, viable community projects that we want to make sure we absolutely are supportive of. There are also communities that don't want to go it on their own and want to do some type of other type of partnership. And so we need to have a broad enough board that and, and system, right, that people can plug in there in a competitive way um, and be thoughtful about how we support all of the avenues, right? Um, you know, we have communities that are already served, but want to be served differently. We have communities that aren't served at all and kind of everything in between and the business model for those will all be different. So it's critical that this board doesn't kind of pigeonhole into one answer, right? That they can look at a suite of opportunity, really understand the business model, understand the capital stacks in a very creative and different way than we've ever done it before. And then work with all of the people so communities, providers, software lenses, right? The value a lot of time comes on top of the infrastructure itself, making sure we're covering affordability and that everybody is connected. Um, all of those pieces have to go into this work. Thank you. Representative Barry, any follow-up? All set. Okay. Any other questions for Commissioner Johnson? Seeing none, uh, thank you very much, Commissioner. The chair now recognizes uh, Mr. Carlos Javier um, Barrio Nuevo for the purposes of making a statement concerning this nomination. Carlos. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator Lawrence. Uh, thank you, Representative Barry, members of the Joint Standing Committee on Energy Utilities and Technology. Uh, my name is Carlos Buenuevo. I'm from the town of Georgetown, and I'm here today to discuss my nomination to the Maine Connectivity Authority's initial board as the member representing the communities of the state. Um, I'm truly honored to be nominated. There are many, many individuals across the state. Almost all of them are unpaid volunteers who are putting in tremendous hours to secure high-speed broadband for their communities. They do it out of a recognition that broadband is essential for their health and many times the survival of their communities. To be selected as their representative is quite humbling to me. I passionately believe broadband can improve communities and create opportunities for all of Maine to thrive. My 25 years of professional experience have again and again shown me the ability of technology to enrich people's lives in new and many times really unexpected ways. Since moving to Maine full-time in 2015, I have been involved in efforts to bring high-speed broadband to Georgetown. Community volunteers formed a partnership between Georgetown and neighboring Arousic and South Port Island that explored all the aspects of broad the broadband question. We've pursued various funding options, different models for broadband, interviewed all the incumbent ISPs in the state, conducted community surveys, held public meetings, held in-depth conversations with the three community select boards, interviewed leaders, supporters of the community broadband projects across Maine and Vermont. We applied for funding from the USDA Reconnect program, and we also work closely with Connect Maine throughout that process, as well as the Island Institute. 
Personally, over this time, I have been involved in numerous conversations with broadband leaders on the future of community broadband across the state. And I have previously submitted testimony before this committee. From all these roads taken and not taken, I'm well acquainted with the challenges facing communities in getting broadband. And that every community and region has varying needs, which argues more for a toolbox of solutions rather than a one size fits all approach. Professionally, since my graduation from business school, I have been engaged in strategic planning, acquisitions, developing new businesses and pursuing operational excellence with a keen understanding of technology changes lives. I bring a business background and an appreciation for building sustainable business models. When I came to Maine, I also became for the first time a small business owner. And as such, I'm well aware of the challenges facing small communities and their economies. However, I believe my greatest relevant accomplishment is that after all that work, the town of Georgetown is poised to start construction on a first class fiber network in the fall. After many twists and turns and learning and adapting to changing conditions, we pulled together a group of private community investors motivated by a shared goal to move the community forward, to fund and quickly push forward the project. I plan to bring all those lessons and that spirit of engagement and creativity to find solutions to the goal of connecting all Mainers um, to this position. I'm especially excited about the day when we can move beyond putting fiber on poles to creating ways to leverage that infrastructure to strengthen communities all over the state. Thank you again for this opportunity to serve. Uh, and that's my statement. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there questions uh, from the committee of the nominee? Representative Foster. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Borianovo, and I'm sure I didn't get that pronunciation uh, quite right as Representative Barry did, but uh, thank you for being here. Uh, first of all, I think you, as well as all of the candidates that have been, the nominees that have been presented to us are certainly well qualified to uh, serve in, in uh, this capacity. Uh, I am concerned, uh, as you may have heard earlier, with uh, uh, how this board was uh, chosen and what parts of the state are represented here by the, the makeup. Mm -hmm. uh, you being from Georgetown, uh, relatively new to the state. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, uh, my question is, uh, we've heard uh, of examples, for instance, the uh, as was mentioned by the commissioner, Islesboro decided on their own and uh, they are uh, for, fortunately, financially, were able to uh, Put up fiber on uh, in their for their community, mm -hmm. uh, and and at great expense, uh, working with the uh, Connect Maine uh, and and what were, monies were available uh, to do so, including I believe it was up towards 1.5 million dollars for uh, uh, pole connection uh, fees, uh, which uh, were included in that project. Uh, I represent a small, much smaller town in rural Maine, uh, the town of Garland, who. Even before I attended my first uh, session in Augusta, uh, invited me to a community meeting where they were discussing broadband. They're served by DSL. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not happy with that. They wanted broadband, but that community, uh, when they looked at a price tag for what their property taxes mm -hmm. would have to uh, fund of, I believe it was around uh, uh, $70,000, they financially said, we can't do this, even mm -hmm. with help from others. So my question is uh, how familiar, uh, looking at where you are from and what you've been dealing with in Georgetown, which I believe is a financially well-off part of the state, uh, how familiar you are with some of the towns like the one not, ones I represent, including Garland, which by the way, is only in the middle of the state. Uh, and of course there are many rural towns north of me all the way up to Saint Agat. So that would be my question, thank you. Well, I, uh, thank you. Let me, let me answer that. Let me answer two parts. Let me ask the first part about whether or not I'm familiar with other uh, communities. And then let me focus on um, a couple of issues you mentioned, which are actually issues that affect every single one of the towns and which is why it argues for a, a approach that's 
doesn't, it's not a one size fits all approach. And the first thing is uh, my experience with Maine over the last 20 years has been primarily with um, the Waterville, Belgrade Lakes region, um, where I have a lot of relatives as well um, that are there. So I've been primarily up in that area. And when I moved to Georgetown, um, you know, that was a, a happy um, circumstance, which I won't go into right here. Um, I've considered myself as very interested in, in a large areas of the state, um, the rural areas. I'm, um, and I'm actually, one of the reasons I really was interested in serving is not because of uh, Georgetown, but because I do really believe that the, we now have an opportunity to be much more strategic about where we put this money and that we need to focus on areas that will never be able to do this on their own. Um, and we need to understand where those areas are. Um, so area, I would also like to say, um, the second part of the question is, you know, your experience that you just related is so typical and it's exactly sort of the experience we went through in Georgetown. Towns here, Georgetown may have affluence but also has a very diverse uh, base of, um, of people and it has a very conservative approach like most towns in Maine to um, how they're going to fund, what they uh, their approach to infrastructure, what their understanding of infrastructure projects are, what their understanding of financing is, and the type of tax bill that they're willing to take on. Um, that has uh, held us back for a long time, where it's very difficult for us to understand how much we want to, which town wants to take on, and what the expenses are. Um, so we've been. Um, the experience you have is exactly what everyone has. The towns need to have um, a clear understanding of what it's gonna cost and who's gonna pay for it and how they're gonna be able to move forward. And they need to have helping hands doing that. Um, in Georgetown specifically, there was not a desire to also take on the tax base there either. Isleboro was a totally different project. Um, Georgetown is a totally different project. A Rousig neighboring, which actually got a USDA reconnect grant is a totally different project. Each one of those communities, each um, had a different understanding of uh, how much risk, how much financial uh, burden they wanted to take on for the town and that affects how that project goes forward. So I do think I have a lot of understanding of the issues involved um, that are applicable to other communities across the state um, of all different economic backgrounds. I hope that answered your question. Thank you. Foster, any follow up? No, thank you. Thank you, Senator. Um, thank you, Mr. Barrio Nuevo, for your willingness to serve and for your being here today. And I just wanted to ask, in your experience with trying to get broadband, uh, true broadband into Georgetown, what was, what was the most difficult part of that experience for you? Up till COVID, the most difficult part of that experience was convincing everyone that this was one of the most essential things that they needed to do. That was absolutely the most important. Pre after COVID, the entire conversation has changed. Um, I think that's why we're all here right now, why the main connectivity authority has been authorized. But that was the single largest thing was, was convincing a broad swath of taxpayers that it was the most important thing we need to do. Thank you, sir. Any follow-up, Representative Cutty? Any other questions for Mr. Barrio Nuevo, or Representative uh, Barry? I'll let Representative Grahowski go first, if you don't mind. Representative Grahowski. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I was wondering, Mr. Uh, Barranuevo, if you could elaborate on any experience you've had on other boards and, and what that experience might bring to your service to the state on this board. Um, I've, had, uh, I've had direct experience working with um, boards of well, they weren't actually not prop it up of the seven photo agencies, small agencies, as well as a lot of experience working with uh, boards of uh, public media companies. Um, so I think that that as well as the leading the committee through the last couple of years on uh, broadband, I think that what I bring to all my um, activities is a real spirit of collaboration. Um, I have always thought of myself as a collaborator. Um, I'm always interested in hearing everyone's uh, ideas and understanding where the um, strengths and weaknesses of the group are. So um, I think that I look, I think that's actually areas where I really thrive and I'm very excited about working with such a distinguished group of nominees who are actually focused on a really important um, activity with the resources to be able to accomplish it. 
Any follow up, Representative Grahowski? Representative Barry? Thank you, um, Mr. Barry Nuevo. Good to see you. Um, a big fan of what you've done down in, in uh, Georgetown and, and uh, the, the other bridged islands. Uh, very impressive. And appreciate your willingness to, to serve. Um, even though you didn't seek the job, as I understand it. Uh, I, I just wanted to um, ask if you uh, could characterize your views on sort of public versus private, the whole spectrum. And, you know, you, you touched on this a little bit uh, with your answer to Representative Foster. Um, you know, are, are there are there places where, um, you know, the, the right answer is to be to be truly fully publicly owned? Uh, uh, are there places where the answer is to, to give you know, federal taxpayer dollars or state taxpayer dollars to a, to a fully private company where, you know, these are, these are uh, taxpayer monies that you'll be overseeing. And, uh, you know, what is the, the, the ideal range and balance uh, of, uh, of ownership um, of the entities that we should be giving these monies to? I'll be perfectly honest. I do not know what the ideal balance is. Um, I think that, uh, in reviewing, continue to review the statute and, and the advisory committee discussions and other, act, and other discussions, I think are the challenge is to bring connectivity. The first challenge is to bring connectivity to the entire state mm -hmm. rapidly. And I think we will have lots of discussions about rap, what rapid means. Um, Pre-COVID, it was not that, you know, it was whenever, and now it's yesterday. Um, so I don't know what the actual uh, mix is. I think that we should be open. And I think that um, this state is one where the community is not the, the county or the state is necessarily is really the, the one that sort of instigates a lot of these um, initiatives. And every community is very different and their financial resources are really different. Um, and so if, for instance, we want to, when we should, get uh, down east and other areas which will benefit um, economically really tremendously and some of the other trends are going on. Um, we need to figure out where the balance is, where we need to put more funds in to get things done uh, versus other areas which may not need as much um, assistance and may have other resources they can contribute. So I think we need to be very open on the board to understand what that mix is and to always keep in mind that our goal is to get the entire state connected and to do it in a, do it as connected rapidly and in a way that actually ensures that we are putting fire, fiber or other technology in that actually, well, it's fiber, that we're putting in technology that's gonna be future-proof. So that, I think those are the guiding principles. And so I don't have a specific view on what our mix is. Um, other than the goals have to be aligned so that it is for the community benefit. So that I realize that's not a perfect answer, but that's my answer. Representative Barry, any follow up? I have a separate question, uh, but I'll uh, no, defer to represent. Okay, great. Um, well, thank you for that answer, uh, Mr. Barry Nuevo, and, and uh, I appreciate the the thinking. Uh, the other question is regarding uh, conflicts of interest on the board. Um, it's pretty clear to me, looking at your resume, that you um, wouldn't have any. Um, but I I just wanted to ask. You know, we 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 did put this uh, statute, this new section of statute, through quite quickly. And uh, you know, one thing that I uh, personally regret not spending more time on is the provision around conflict of interest. Um, the board is, is uh, required under the statute uh, to abstain from any uh, votes in which the, the specific contract, the immediate contract um, uh, involves a, a, a direct pecuniary interest um, in, in the, the contracted company. But there, there are degrees of separation there. Um, a subcontractor, for example, I don't think is implicated uh, in, uh, in that conflict of interest uh, provision in the, in the bill. So I'm curious about whether you might favor additional discussion on the board, additional definition uh, uh, given by the board uh, around conflict of interest as a matter of board policy uh, were you to, to serve on, on this new board. Uh, if if it makes sense, I honestly don't have a specific mm -hmm. thought in mind on that right now. I... Mm -hmm. 
as a follow-up, Mr. Chair. Go ahead, Representative Barry. If I may. Um, I, I, I do uh, think that you will be in a position to be adopting bylaws, um, you know, additional policies. The board certainly has that latitude. So um, I guess let me rephrase it. Is, is conflict of interest something that is important to you as a, as a matter of, of uh, good public policy and use of these taxpayer dollars? Um, and, and, and to the extent that it is, um, would you favor discussion on the board about, about board policies? Yes, it is important. I would favor discussion. Yes. Great. Thank you. Senator Vitelli. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Carlos, it's wonderful to see you here today. Thank you for stepping up to do this. I want to just say that if it were not for your involvement and your willingness to collaborate, as you indicated, I don't think Arousic would be as far along as we are in our own planning for the Arousic Broadband Authority. Um, and so thank you again. Uh, appreciate all that you're bringing to this position. I look forward to supporting your nomination. But that said, I'm just wondering, um, not to be too competitive here, but do you think it's going to be Georgetown or Arousic that actually gets their fiber to every household first? Thank you. Uh, I don't know if I want to answer that. You don't have to. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you, you. You don't need to answer that, but I just wanted to say that Georgetown and Arousic have a historical, um, friendly, competitive uh, relationship. And it's been to both our benefits, I think, in this regard, because it has stimulated both communities to move forward with um, broadband and our connectivity. So just wanted to make that point and thank you again, Carlos. Thank you. Are there other questions for Mr. Barrio Nuevo? Carlos, I also want to thank you again for applying. This discussion of diversity is something that comes up in, on virtually every appointment process mm -hmm. I know, and it's impossible to get gender diversity, geographic diversity, you know, economic diversity, background diversity on each board. And it's, it's tough in a state like Maine. And you probably are one of the more diverse people. Uh, you bring a lot of diversity to the board. I can't remember when we've had many Hispanic people in Maine who have served on boards and commissions, frankly. And I was very impressed by your background, particularly on your background in public broadcasting. Um, I served for 10 years on the board of trustees of the Maine Public Broadcasting mm -hmm. Network. Uh, but also your work on blackvoices.com and your work in reaching out to minority communities. Uh, and my question revolves around that. We had a, a bill that came before us. We didn't act on it, but it was brought forward as trying to figure out ways to get broadband to minority, immigrant, and other communities in Maine who tend to have difficulty accessing broadband. Uh, we do have immigrant populations here in Maine spread throughout, and we do have a lot of migrant workers in Maine who come to Maine and work for periods of time and stay and live in Maine um, that we want to be able to provide access to in rural areas. And I just wanted to get your perspective while we have you here on what are some of the unique challenges and some of the ways we can reach out um, to, uh, you know, underserved, uh, lower income immigrant um, minority communities in offering broadband? Well, I think one of the conversations that will continue to come up is this idea of sustainability, or, you know, affordability um, and, um, and creating access. And I think one of the challenges here will be creating, will be broadening the definition of something beyond just uh, subsidizing dollars to creating uh, community centers, hotspots, reaching out, trying to focus on training, trying to expand that idea of what um, connectivity is. And I think when you're talking about diverse communities, that tends to dovetail also with lower economic. And it's a question of, you know, are you um, finding where people gather and are you finding ways to be in those communities and to create um you know, opportunities for people to uh, be able to access computers, be able to um, access telemedicine areas where 
they live and where they're comfortable. And so that's going to be some of the challenges. And again, it's sort of this, what is the definition of our, our work and what is the definition of connectivity over time? Is it just fiber on poles or do we start to work on those other aspects of trying to um, you know, ensure that maybe projects always are doing Wi-Fi hotspots in areas like that, you know, things, things of that nature. So I think it does sort of dovetail in this question of, you know, what is connectivity and what is, uh, um, you know, how do you make sure everyone has access? Does that answer your question? Yeah, I really appreciate that answer. And I can tell just from your answer, you're going to be a great asset to the board in, in helping us address that issue and advising us in the legislature on how we can uh, help that issue being addressed, so thank you. Any other questions from the committee? Okay, thank you very much, Carlos. Uh, we'll you. now go on to taking comments. And Jordan, if you can keep Carlos in the uh, participant uh, category, we'll go on now to take comments from persons attending this hearing who wish to speak for or against uh, this nomination. So if you are in the attendees list, and you want to speak for or against this nomination, uh, we'll just wait a minute and I'll give you a minute to raise your hand and we will do what's called beaming you across from attendee to participant. Okay, I don't see anyone uh, in the attendees list. We have five attendees. Um, I, anyone who has a written statement but does not wish to speak should have submitted that statement um, with the committee clerk prior to today's hearings. All such statements must contain the name and residence of the person who prepared the statement. A copy of each written statement presented to the committee at this hearing will be made available prior to the nominee. Excuse Senator me. Lawrence, um, I beamed across Andrew Butcher um, okay. from the main broadband I coalition. I apologize, Andrew. Um, I'll recognize Andrew Butcher to speak. Andrew. Good morning. Thanks very much. Uh, greetings, Senator Lawrence and Representative Barry and members of the Energy Utilities and Technology Committee. Uh, my name is Andrew Butcher and I am located here in Portland. This testimony is on behalf of the Maine Broadband Coalition, uh, your partner in creating solutions for broadband policy and programming to testify today in support of confirmation of the full slate of the nominated board of directors to the Maine Connectivity Authority. <clears throat> Um, through the course of the 2021 legislative session, the coalition has provided ongoing input into the legislative process, shaping the main connectivity authority. Additionally, we've actively participated in the Department of Economic and Community Development's stakeholder engagement processes through both the working group and advisory committee. We know just how critical the function of the connectivity authority board will be to the future of broadband infrastructure in Maine. Um, the board will serve a paramount role in setting a course for success, recruiting and empowering staff to execute goals and priorities and establishing new standards for performance, accountability and financial sustainability. For these reasons, we enthusi enthusiastically endorse the full slate of nominated board members to guide the startup and operationalization of this critical new agency. The range of expertise, professional experience, and technical acumen make for a high caliber leadership to achieve the bold goals set forth by LD 1484 and the priorities set forward by this committee. The board will have no small task in the first phase of organizational development as it seeks to conduct an accelerated startup and operationalization of the agency. Board members will need to maintain both a high level of vision and pragmatic orientation towards implementation. They will need to bolster investments in the tried and true community driven broadband process, as well as pursue new partnerships, facilitate innovative public financing, rapidly deploy and rapidly deploy capital to maximize numerous co benefits. To this extent, the coalition looks forward to working with this board and future staff towards the implementation of shared goals and priorities, and we encourage unanimous confirmation of all nominated candidates. It's time to get to work. We're excited to do so. Uh, you all have had a tremendous session this year. Thank you so much for all of your collective service. It's really been a pleasure to work with you and I look forward to continuing to get the job done. Oh, Thank you. Are there questions from the committee for uh, Mr. Butcher? Uh, Representative Wood. 
Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> um, Andrew, I'm not gonna call you the formal Mr. Butcher. Thank you. He's a constituent who lives around the corner from me. But I know that the work you've been doing with the Broadband Coalition is statewide. Um, it's a great group. Um, and I just wondered from your perspective that the slate is really geographically um, within an hour of Augusta, I believe all seven positions. So I just wondered from the coalition standpoint, what's the feeling about the lack of geographic diversity? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Barb, Representative Wood. Um, you know, I, I will say a couple of things to that extent and certainly listen with interest to the conversation just now. Um, uh, first and foremost, I'm very mindful um, to be cautious about how to speak for the full breadth of our coalition. Um, uh, what I will say is that we've had many conversations and many points of engagement around the planning for the authority and the board. And I have not heard one comment regarding a concern around geographic diversity. Um, uh, I will also say that I think one of the most incredible things about Maine um, are that there are, are truly pockets of brilliance everywhere. Um, and, you know, when I think about the, the Georgetown model, as we've just heard a little bit about, it's, it's, it's truly a, a shining example of that um, as one example. Um, and I think it's impossible to have a singular perspective that represents the diversity of main communities and the geographic diversity in particular. Um, I will also say that I think that there's probably no better proxy for concern around community representation and geographic representation than the coalition. Um, we're very pleased that four of the candidates have a close connection through their agency or company with the broadband coalition um, and that the broadband coalition has at least some point of connectivity to almost everybody who's been nominated. So I feel that um, while there may not be specific geographic representation on the board itself as highlighted, I think the geographic diversity of the coalition will ensure that there is that mindset, that orientation, and that concern that is represented through the policies and decisions that are implemented by the board. Uh, just one more question. Oh, um, Barb, yes. Um, so you're, you're comfortable with the involvement that the coalition will have with the authority? Um, I'm, I, am, I am comfortable with how it appears to be taking shape. Yeah. I think the, the coalition will continue to have its role in both being uh, a helpful, proactive partner and solution, and also a helpful guide in um, uh, holding board and staff accountable. Okay, thank you. Appreciate your perspective. Thank you. Representative Grohowski. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Andrew, for being here um, and sharing the perspective of the coalition. To that end, I was curious how you solicited feedback um, from coalition members, or maybe it was the advisory committee um, before putting together this testimony to speak for the group. Um, part of why I'm asking is I see in the advisory committee there are, there is an amazing geographic um, component uh, to, to that membership. And um, we did receive some written comment to us that flagged concern. Uh, and so I'm just wondering, how did you um, put together this, this testimony? Yeah, thank you. Um, testimony today was uh, something that was generated with the review and input of the coalition's policy committee. Um, policy committee is empowered by the coalition's advisory committee, which is the full, it's now 33 members, it soon will be 36 members, um, representing the range and geography of industry, uh, diversity of industry, sector and geography. Um, we as a advisory committee did discuss the nomination uh, of the board slate at our June 28th advisory committee member, at our advisory committee meeting. Um, at that time, there was uh, no concern, no flag that was raised regarding representation. Um, and we as a policy committee have had ongoing conversations regarding the nominations that are presented today. Does that, does that help answer your question? Um, yeah, I think so. 
Okay. Thank you. Representative Wood, did you have another question? Okay. Uh, Representative Barry. Yeah, thank you. Um, good to see you, Mr. Butcher, uh, as always. Uh, enjoyed working with you uh, uh, as part of the Broadband Caucus and with the main Broadband Coalition. So, um, so your testimony today is on behalf of the entire Broadband Coalition or specifically the Policy Committee? Uh, policy Committee is empowered by the Advisory Committee uh, to review and submit testimony. Great. Okay. And, and who is on the Policy Committee? Uh, policy committee uh, has about a, ranges. Uh, it's open to all advisory committee members. Um, and so it ebbs and flows, but it includes pretty consistent membership from Grossmart, Maine, AARP, the Island Institute, uh, uh, Franklin County Economic Development Council, um, uh, some of our, the ISP partners, including GWI, um, Otelco, uh, and Axiom are consistent participants as well. Um, and again, policy committee meetings are open to all who have uh, completed a network agreement to be a part of the advisory committee. Great, a follow up if I may. Representative Barry. Thank you. Um, are there any policy committee members who's, who's, who are part of the, the slate of nominees uh, who, who's, uh, who you're supporting today? Um, Again, uh, policy committee attendees can include all advisory committee members. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, advisory committee members from Tilson have participated in policy committees uh, meetings as it pertains to um, uh, some of the legislation that we have weighed in this year. Um, but no representatives or their agencies or companies uh, who were a part of the board nominations have been a part of policy conversations as it pertains to submission of testimony. Got it. Thank you very much. Um, I will also say, uh, if I may, Representative Barry, to one of your last questions, um, mm. your question regarding ensuring that the board maintains and prioritizes questions of conflict of interest. Um, which I think is a, a excellent point to be bringing up to candidates. And I will say that that is exactly the kind of issue that we as a coalition will want to weigh in on and uh, ensure that the board is being proactive and thoughtful in their decision-making and policy setting. Mm. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Butcher? So Andrew, I, and I do appreciate your comments on diversity. I keep reinforcing to my committee members that um, diversity is a matter of perspective, geographic diversity. So I do wanna point out that every one of these nominees is north of Portland, lives north of Portland. None live south. Uh, York County and south of Portland is probably about one out of every six people in the state and not one is a member uh, on the committee. I'm comfortable with that because I think there's a lot of great perspective uh, Cornville is a long way from Kittery. Um, it's much closer to uh, Representative Foster than it is to me, but I'm comfortable with the, uh, with the diversity that uh, is on the committee, on the nominees. Thank you, Senator Lawrence. I, I may also just reiterate that um, as many of you know, I sort of serve in a, in a dual role. I both am Director of Innovation and Resilience for the Greater Portland Council of Governments, as well as serve as the staffing capacity for the Maine Broadband Coalition, which is a statewide entity. Um, and I myself have had to speak with my team at GPCOG and our representatives and clarify that why it's a good thing that there aren't necessarily representatives from our region who are a part of this board. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, it's a big state with a lot of different needs and interests. And so I, I too feel like there is um, a, a, a really well-rounded set of expertise and perspective that constitutes this full board slate. Thank you. Other questions for Mr. Butcher? Seeing none, um, I'll just complete the statement about written statements. So a copy of each written statement presented to the committee at this hearing will be made available to the nominee prior to the committee's vote, and the nominee will have an opportunity to respond to the written comment. Those who wish to speak in person registered uh, with the committee clerk prior to the start of this hearing will be called upon by the chairs. 
at which time they will be promoted to panelists uh, status in Zoom and can be heard. When it is your turn to speak, please observe the following. State your name, your place of residence to, uh, prior to presenting your testimony. Only comments concerning the suitability of this particular nominee for this particular position will be considered in order. All other comments will be considered out of order after you're done speaking and there are no other questions from members, you will be returned to the attendee status and the next person uh, will be called. I see no other public comments. So all public comments having been taken, the committee will now proceed as follows. Review any additional written comments on the nomination that have been received by the committee. Vote on the nomination and notify the President of the Senate pursuant to Title III, MRSA Section 157 and the Joint Rules. The vote must be taken within 35 or 40 judicial officer days from the date of the governor's written notice. Hearing by the Joint Standing Committee on Utilities, Technology, Energy, excuse me, Energy, Utilities and Technology for Carlos uh, Javier Bar Baranovo, Bar excuse me, Barrio no Nuevo of Georgetown for appointment to the Maine Community Advisory Authority is closed. In accordance with the law, the committee will now take a vote on this nomination. Uh, we can take it, we may not take it sooner than 15 minutes after the close of this public hearing, unless all committee members who are present agree. At this time, therefore, the, ch the chair will inquire whether any member present wishes to uh, wait the 15 minutes before taking the vote. I just ask you to physically raise your hand. Okay. Representative Barry, Representative Brahowski, and Representative Wood. <laughs> pause for 15 minutes uh, before we take this vote. So I'll ask you just to stop your video um, and mute yourself, and we'll be back in uh, 15 or more minutes. Thank you.
We are coming back for a vote and if folks could turn off, turn on their video again, that would be terrific. We'll get started when we have a quorum. Mr. Chair, we have a quorum. We do have a quorum? Yes. Great, and Carlos, I do apologize, but you're learning something about what's called <laughs> legislative time. And uh, it does not operate on the same system as Eastern Standard Time. So. <clears throat> Pending question uh, before the committee is that the Joint Standing Committee on Energy Utilities and Technology recommend to the Senate of the 130th Maine Legislature that the nomination of Mr. Carlos Javier Barrio Nuevo of Georgetown for appointment to the Maine Connectivity uh, Authority be confirmed in accordance with 3 MRSA Chapter 6, Section 157, and with the joint rules of the 130th Maine Legislature. The vote will be taken by the yeas and nays. A vote of yes will be in favor recommending confirmation. A vote of no will be against uh, the recommendation, the motion to recommend confirmation. Is the committee ready for the question? Okay, the committee, will, uh, the committee clerk will call the roll. Great, we'll start with Senator Lawrence. Yes. Senator Lawrence is a yes. Senator Vitelli? Yes. Senator Vitelli is a yes. Senator Stewart? Senator Stewart is absent. Representative Barry? Yes. Representative Barry is a yes. Representative Cuddy? Yes. Representative Cuddy is a yes. Representative Grahowski? Yes. Representative Grahowski is a yes. Representative Kessler? Representative Kessler is absent. Representative Ziegler? Representative Ziegler is absent. Representative Wood? Yes. Representative Wood is a yes. Representative Wadsworth? Yay. Representative Wadsworth is a yay. Representative Grignan? Representative Grignan is absent. Representative Foster? Uh, no. Representative Foster is a no. Representative Carlo? Yes. Representative Carlo is a yes. That is eight in favor, one opposed four absences. Okay, eight members having voted in favor, one in opposition and four being absent. It's the vote of the committee that the uh, recommendation of the committee of the nomination of uh, Mr. Carlos Javier uh, Barrio Nuevo of Georgetown for appointment to the Maine Connectivity Authority is confirmed. Thank you very much, Carlos. Congratulations uh, from all the committee members. And um, just so you know, this will now go to the Senate on the 19th, and it would take a vote of two thirds of the Senate to go against the committee's recommendation for your nomination not to be confirmed. So don't be surprised when you get to the Senate and everybody's voting no, they're actually voting in favor of you if they're voting no. Thank you, folks. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Dwayne. Okay, we're gonna go on to our uh, second nominee. And I just wanna to say to the nominees, um, this is legislative time. So we never know uh, what to expect. And we've been uh, working on this. My thought is maybe the next ones may go a little bit faster, um, but the schedule we had today was to work up to about noon time to get the four in the morning done and then come back for the three in the afternoon at one o'clock. 
But in talking with um, uh, my co-chair and thinking about it, I think we're going to push as hard as we can to get these four done and then break for lunch so we can let the people know in the afternoon exactly what time we will be coming back, um, uh, that it won't be at 1 o'clock. We'll give them a later time when we give committee members a chance to get lunch and, uh, and come back. So we'll continue on with these four, uh, four people uh, coming before us, and we'll move to get these four Okay, we'll now uh, uh, have the public hearing on the Joint Standing Committee of Energy Utilities and Technology for the purposes of considering the nomination by the governor of Daniel P. Bellier of Vassalboro for appointment to the Maine Connectivity Authority. Under the laws and rules of the legislature, this committee is required to hold a public hearing and to recommend confirmation or denial of the nominee by a majority vote of the committee of the members present and voting. As chairs of the committee, Representative Barry and I will send a written notice of the committee's recommendation to the president of the Senate. The committee will hear testimony from and have an opportunity to question the governor or her representative and the nominee and any other persons present who wish to speak for or against uh, this nomination. And as a reminder, this um, process is being live streamed over YouTube. So if you're a panelist, you should expect everything you do and say to become legendary history. So uh, be careful of your comments and your gestures and your facial expressions. Pursuant to Title III, Section 157 of the Maine Statutes, which requires there to be an affirmative motion to recommend confirmation of the nominee, the chair recognizes uh, Representative Seth Berry for the purposes of making such a motion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank, Thank you. I move that the Joint Standing Committee on Energy, Utilities, and Technology recommend confirmation of Mr. Daniel P. Bellier of Vassalboro for appointment to the Maine Connectivity Authority. Thank you. Uh, Representative Berry has made the motion and reminder a copy of the statutory requirements for this position is available on our website. The chair recogni now recognizes Commissioner, Commissioner Heather Johnson for the purposes of making a statement concerning this nomination. Commissioner Johnson. Uh, thank you, Senator Lawrence, Representative Berry and distinguished members of the Joint Standing Committee on Energy, Utilities and Technology. My name is Heather Johnson and I'm the Commissioner of the Department of Economic and Community Development. I'm here today on behalf of the governor to speak in support of the appointment of Daniel Bellier of Vassalboro to the Maine Connectivity Authority. Daniel Bellet is a graduate of Eastern Maine Vocational Technical Institute, now Eastern Maine Community College, with a degree in Applied Science and Business Management, and has spent the majority of his career working for Eastern Maine Community College and now the Maine Community College system. In his time at EMCC, Dan served in numerous roles, including Director of Housing Residential Life, Director of Health and Safety, Director of Facilities Management, and Director of Administrative Student Services and Auxiliary Enterprises. In 2016, Dan, Dan joined the Maine Community College System to assist in the transition to a new system president and manage statewide system projects. He then transitioned into a role as Director of Operational Support for Finance and Administration. For the last four years, Dan has worked on workforce development and currently serves as the Chief Workforce Development Officer for the system. In this role, he's responsible for providing statewide leadership and coordination in support of MCCS's statutory mission to meet Maine's workforce needs with the goals of creating an educated, skilled, and adaptable labor force that is responsible to the changing economic needs, which we know are becoming more reliant on high-speed broadband networks every day. Dan's extensive experience in higher ed, project management, and workforce development will make him a valuable member of the Maine Connectivity Authority. And on behalf of the governor, I urge you to support his nomination. I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Are there any questions for the governor's um, spokesperson? I shouldn't say spokesperson, but for Commissioner Johnson. Representative Foster. Thank you, Senator. And uh, Commissioner, I may have missed it, but uh, I think you were going to let us know the length of term and also which slot that these individuals would be filling. Yes, thank, thank you, Representative Foster. I apologize for that. So 
Mr. Vellier is the member who possesses expertise in education system needs. And I misspoke. I had on my chart how the terms um, that I thought, um, but apparently what happens with staggered boards is after the boards are nominated, then the staggered terms are applied. So are you saying, Commissioner, that we won't know this staggered commission? They all serve for three years. And then how does that work? Well, apparently before they're sworn in, there's a staggered term piece center, but let me check that while, while this conversation goes on, let me get back to the boards and commissions team and make sure I get you an action. We all sit around and draw straws and whoever comes out with the shortest so. straw has the shortest term. I think so. <laughs> okay. Now, um, I, I know there is, um, I think there are, there would likely be a stagger because there are three members with telecom experience. You would want to stagger those smartly so that you create consistency through there. Um, those are the primary ones where you have overlapping experience base. Um, so that would be the place that that's probably most important. Okay. Okay, thank you. Are there other questions for uh, Commissioner Johnson, the governor's representative? Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner. The chair now recognizes Mr. Daniel P. Bellier for the purposes of making a statement concerning this nomination. Good morning, Senator Lawrence, Representative Barry and members of the Joint Standing Committee on Energy, Utilities and Technology. My name is Daniel Bellier. I live in Vassarboro, Maine, and I'm here today to discuss with you my nomination to the Maine Connectivity Authority. It is my honor to have this opportunity to share my interests, experience, background that I can bring to the Maine Connectivity Authority. I've worked for the Maine Community College System for almost 33 years, and for the past several years, I've served as its Chief Workforce Development Officer. In this role, I've, I've, I've managed our short-term training division, which includes the Maine Quality Centers and other statewide short-term training projects. My past work experience inc included working at Eastern Maine Community College for 28 years in a variety of administrative positions. During that time, I managed uh, many large scale capital projects for the college, including new buildings and much needed upgrades to, it, to its infrastructure. I have an in-depth knowledge and experience in facilities management, financial strategic planning, along with property management and development. I believe these roles give me a good understanding of capital projects and infrastructure upgrades. I've also seen firsthand how our learners struggled in areas of Maine that lacked affordable, accessible, high quality broadband. I believe access to broadband is an economic equalizer that all Mainers need to have to become economically free and work where they choose. Affordable, accessible and high quality broadband is a cornerstone to advancing economic freedom and will allow, allow increased prosperity in communities that lack broadband. During the pandemic, we saw many of our main employees work remotely. The workers who had access to high quality broadband were incredibly productive working remotely. However, many Mainers who did not have access to high quality broadband were left behind and were not equally included in our state workforce due to our current infrastructure. The Maine Community College System, as well as other Maine public higher education inst institutions did what we could providing hotspots and opening our Wi-Fi networks to benefit the students of Maine. But these efforts were just short-term band-aids for a small population. I've seen that training and education, whether it's short-term training credentials, licensure, certificates, two-year associate degrees, merged with high quality broadband will increase the number of Mainers we can train and upskill for better job opportunities, wages that will allow our Maine families to prosper. If the committee approves my nomination and the Senate confirms me, I'll bring an in-depth understanding on our workforce and educational needs as it relates to affordable, accessible, high quality broadband. The establishment of the Maine Connectivity Authority is a positive forward looking opportunity that will benefit areas of Maine in advancing communication and infrastructure that will have long lasting benefits to our state. 
I wanna thank you for this opportunity to share my experiences. I'm ready to be part of this exciting project and thank you for your time considering my nomination and I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Uh, the chair would ask if any member of the committee has questions of the nominee. Representative Foster. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, Mr. Blair. Uh, from your time at Eastern Maine Community College, you're well aware that uh, a lot of the students that attend there come from some of the more rural, mm -hmm. uh, some of the poorest, and uh, some of the far reaching smaller school districts that we have in the state of Maine. Uh, uh, including air, towns that I represent, but more importantly, towns even further away and, and more remote than that. I'm wondering uh, if you could speak to what you would see, uh, not only for the, the students in those schools, but also for the adult education piece and everything uh, that's connected with that. If you could tell, tell us what you think uh, would be uh, a challenge that you see there that uh, you, help, you think you could help bring solutions to uh, as a member of this board or, or bring expertise in those areas to as a member of this board. Thank you. Yeah, um, thank you, um, Representative Foster. Absolutely. Um, you know, Maine, Maine's, Maine's a group of really small communities and there are significant struggles that our learners have um, when, when trying to find education and training. And a lot of times those learners don't have the ability to go to areas and receive that training and education. I think the work that was that has taken place at Eastern Maine Community College and in meeting our learners where they are, not where we think they should be, is paramount to how we're going to bridge the skills gap that, that exists. And I think you know the, the work that we certainly have been doing with Maine Quality Centers and training um, folks in short-term training, um, we're meeting them where they are. And a lot of them have significant challenges. Um, a lot of our learners need the hands-on um, instruction, but at the same time, we can provide instruction um, through, through a broadband or through a Zoom, Zoom teaching model in a, hybrid, in a hybrid situation. There are significant challenges with housing and transportation, childcare, just to name a few, and as someone's trying to um, gain new skills and acquire that next job. I think the work we've we, we did at Eastern Maine Community College. I think the work that's taking place at all of our seven community colleges is really meeting that need. I've seen over the last four years, how we've really jumped in and helped those folks gain an entry level um, job and a, and, a, and a wage with meaning. And that's, that's those, those learners who are, who are right out of high school or those adult learners who are transitioning. And there are significant challenges and and fear about coming and getting training. And I think, you know, it's important for us to bring that to where they are um, and meet them where they are. And I think we need to be kind. Um, and I think we need to, to do everything we can to reduce the barriers. And, and having real access to high-speed broadband will do that. Um, we can reach areas that we haven't reached before. Um, and expansion is gonna provide that opportunity to all parts of Maine, not just certain sectors. Representative Foster, any follow-up? Any other questions uh, from members of the committee of the nominee? Representative Barry? You need to unmute yourself. Sorry, I was muted. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Bellier, for uh, being willing to serve in this very important capacity, and also for your work uh, with the community college system. Um, I am... Uh, very impressed with the main quality centers and the work you've done there uh, and with the work of our community colleges here in Maine in general. And just for the record, to me, um, uh, Bangor is Northern Maine, but I realize that I'm in a minority with that view on this committee. So um, I, I do want to uh, <clears throat> also uh, um, convey to you the importance from my perspective of your position uh, if you if you are confirmed that you are the representative uh, with expertise in the needs of our education system. There is an ex officio member who rep is, is uh, a representative of the University of Maine, the chancellor or their designee. Uh, <clears throat> but um, you are the 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 other member who brings the perspective of the education system. 
And I would note that both you and the chancellor or their representative um, are from the higher education community. Um, I'm particularly concerned about the needs, especially in the past year with the pandemic of our K-12 population, of our uh, early childhood population, um, who of course are um, you know, learning uh, at, at, at in, a, in a very different way uh, with different needs and, um, and also, uh, you know, are critically dependent on broadband uh, in this in this uh, era, so um, I I, I want to ask um, if we can count on you to to really give extra thought to the um, the the zero to 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 twelfth grade uh, population and uh, and to be a voice and an advocate uh, you know and a proactive member of the board um, on behalf of of those younger learners as well. Yep, um, absolutely, Representative Barry. I think it's really important to acknowledge that, you know, pathways from all of these stages, whether it's K through 12, it's a community college system or a university system, it's mm -hmm. important. Um, we're, we're facing um, a significant workforce challenge. Mm -hmm. And there are some demographics that are, that are really kicking us in the head. Um, we've got around 40, over 40% 40 of our high school students who are not going on to higher education or training in the first year. Um, that's a significant challenge. And we've worked really hard um, with, our, with our high school partners um, and, and, and below um, to find ways to, to reach out to them. I think it's also important to be working with our CTE population because they have a great, um, great, great piece of learning that's happening there. And we need to continue to dig in and find guided pathways from from that education along with us and, and continue on. So yes, you can count on me for that. Thank you. Other questions from the committee? Representative Grahowski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, uh, Mr. Bellier. If I'll get your name right, apologies if not. Um, I like to ask everybody uh, to reflect a bit on their previous board experience and um, what they've learned from that and what they would bring here. And I see you in particular have significant board experience, including I think currently serving on four state boards. So my secondary question to you is um, how do you do it? <laughs> and how do you plan to do it? Because this board I think is going to be a lot of work um, to get up and running. Sure, um, thank you for the question. I, I what, One of the things that I, I bring to every conversation um, is um, my certainly listening skills and critical thinking skills and, and um, being part of um, understanding um, what's happening, um, certainly in those different experiences. Um, I have served on a number of boards um, in the Bangor region. Um, the Housing Authority was one of those. And, and the things I learned um, from, from that experience and others is understanding those folks who are in those, in the, in those places. And it's, it's the customer, it's the resident. Um, it's the folks who are who are receiving those types of services. So um, I've learned a lot from those experiences. Um, I do pace myself um, and and willing to um, make sure I have time, quality time, to be able to be involved with, involved with those activities. Um, I've 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 listened and I've um, considered this this spot, and I believe I have the time to do it. Um, I think I can make a contribution that's broader than just thinking um, in the lane that I currently am. I think we need to think about the zero to six um, continuum in education, and that includes um, everything in between. So I feel comfortable on the workload. Um, I've learned a lot from my experiences and, and I try to be you know, as humble and, and as gracious as, as, as one can be and, and just really listen in and, and listen to others and make critical decisions. I also think I'm very curious. Um, I'm, I'm one that will ask the questions that folks won't ask, and I'm not afraid to do that. Um, and I've, I've learned that that serves me well when, when I don't understand something. Other questions? Seeing none, thank you very much uh, for your testimony. Uh, we will now take comments from persons attending this hearing who wish to speak for or against this nomination. I previously went over the rules for uh, speaking either for, nor, uh, for or against the nomination, so I won't go that, over that again. But I just ask if there's anybody in the attendees who wishes to speak
for or against this nomination or anyone who has contacted um, Jordan uh, who wishes to speak for or against. Jordan, do you have any, know of anyone? Uh, there's no one in the attendees list with their hand up and there was no one who registered ahead of time to testify. Okay, thank you. So we're ready to go on to our next uh, stage. So all public comments having been taken, the committee will now proceed as fo follows. We'll review any additional written comments on the nomination that have been received by the committee. We will vote on the nomination and we will notify the Senate president pursuant to state statute. I will now declare the hearing of the Committee on Energy Utilities and Technology uh, for Mr. Daniel P. Bellier of, excuse me, and I forgot your town. Is it Vassalboro? Vassalboro. Um, of to the Main Connectivity Authority Board is closed. In accordance with the law, the committee will, may not take a vote on this nomination sooner than 15 minutes after the close of the public hearing unless the committee members who are present agree. And I'll just ask, is there anyone on the committee who wishes to take a 15 minute break or who objects to going directly to the vote? If you do object, just raise your hand. Okay, I don't see any objections, so we'll go directly to the vote. The uh, pending question before the committee is that the Joint Standing Committee on Energy Utilities and Technology recommend to the Senate of the 130th Maine Legislature that the nomination of Mr. Daniel P. Bellier of Vassalboro for appointment to the Maine Connectivity Authority be confirmed. In accordance with 3 MRSA Chapter 6, Section 151, and with the joint rules of the 130th Maine Legislature, the vote will be taken by the yeas and nays. A vote of yes will be in favor of uh, recommending the nomination. A vote of no will be in, against recommending the nomination. Is the committee ready for the question? The chair, the clerk will call the roll. I'll start with Senator Lawrence. Yes. Senator Lawrence is a yes. Senator Vitelli? Yes. Senator Vitelli is a yes. Senator Stewart? Senator Stewart is absent. Representative Barry? Yes. Representative Barry is a yes. Representative Cuddy? Yes. Representative Cuddy is a yes. Representative Grahowski? Yes. Representative Grahowski is a yes. Representative Kessler? Representative Kessler is absent. Representative Ziegler? Representative Ziegler is absent. Representative Wood? Yes. Representative Wood is a yes. Representative Wadsworth? Yes. Representative Wadsworth is a yes. Representative Grignan? Representative Grignan is absent. Representative Foster? Yes. Representative Foster is a yes. And Representative Carlo? Representative Carlo is absent. Uh, I believe that is eight in favor with five absences. Eight members having voted in favor of the nomination and uh, no members having voted against it and five members being absent. It is a vote of the Joint Standing Committee on Energy, Utilities and Technology that the nomination of Mr. Daniel P. Bellier of Vassalboro for appointment to the Maine Connectivity Authority be confirmed. Congratulations, <coughs> Bellier. And you've been through this before, so you know uh, what the Senate will be doing on the 19th. And, um, and we look forward to your service. Thank you. Great, so uh, Nathan Carlo, did you have something you wanted to say? Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I apologize that I didn't get back in time for the vote. I was handling a, uh, uh, a child, uh, child on child dispute here within the, <laughs> within the with, among, the, among the children. Um, I, if I were present, I would have voted uh, yes in favor of the nomination. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, and I believe Joe Boucher is the person from the governor's office here for the nominations as well as Heather. And I'm just gonna call it now and ask them, Joe, to inform the people this afternoon that we'll be taking up their nominations at two o'clock. It looks like we're probably gonna finish up somewhere around one and then we'll send uh, committee members to lunch. So I do wanna give the 
people who were waiting or who are potentially there at one o'clock um, notice that they're going to be on at two o'clock instead. So I see Joe disappeared from the attendee. So I assume he's going to just let them know that they don't have to be here till two o'clock. Yes, I will do that. Okay, thank you. Okay, we'll go on to our uh, next nomination. Hey, this is a public hearing of the Joint Standing Committee on Energy Utilities and Technology for the purposes of considering the nomination of Danielle Lauder of Cornville for appointment to the Maine Connectivity Authority. Under the laws and the rules of the legislature, this committee is required to hold a public hearing and direct recommend confirmation or denial of the nominee by a majority vote of the committee members present and voting. Pursuant to Title III, Section 157 of the Maine Statutes, which requires there to be an affirmative motion to recommend confirmation of the nominee, the Chair recognizes Representative Berry for the purposes of making such a motion. And you just I, have to unmute yourself, Seth. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Before I uh, make this motion, I do want to uh, note for the committee that um, in, in the packet uh, that we received with respect to um, Ms. Lauder, there was a missing first page in her resume. That was not her omission. Uh, it happened somewhere in the nonpartisan uh, staffing process. Uh, but I'm just gonna ask our clerk if he could make sure that we all have that first page of the resume. Um, and with that, I will proceed to my motion. And Mr. Chair, I move that the Joint Standing Committee on Energy Utilities and Technology recommend confirmation of Ms. Danielle Lauder of Cornville for appointment to the Maine Connectivity Authority. Thank you, Representative Barry. A uh, copy of the statutory requirements for this position is available on our website. The chair now recognizes Commissioner Heather Johnson for the purposes of making a statement concerning this nomination. Commissioner. Great, thank you, Senator Lawrence. Senator Lawrence, Representative Barry, and distinguished members of the Joint Standing Committee on Energy, Utilities, and Technology. My name is Heather Johnson, and I am the Commissioner of the Maine Department of Economic and Community Development. I'm here today on behalf of the governor to speak in support of the appointment of Danielle Lauder of Cornville to the Maine Connectivity Authority. Danielle Lauder of Cornville is a graduate of the University of Maine with a degree in biology and has completed graduate coursework in public health at the University of New England. She has spent most of her career working in public health, including roles as Healthy Maine Partnership Director, a workplace health and wellness coordinator, a project manager for Maine CDC cardiovascular health program, and program manager for technology supported initiatives at medical care development. Danielle is currently the co-director of the medical care development public health and program director of Northeast Telehealth Resource Center. In her role as co-director of MCD, she works to advance their public health mission and align program development with the mission, as well as continuing to update web and social presence, develop a relationship with funders and increase collaboration with other organizations locally, regionally and nationally. As program director for the Northeast Telehealth Resource Center, Danielle manages a program that provides technical assistance for the creation and expansion of telehealth services to the six New England states, New York and New Jersey, which makes her well aware of the challenges faced by telehealth providers. Danielle Lauder's extensive public health and telehealth experience will make her an excellent addition to the Maine Connectivity Authority. And on behalf of the governor, I urge you to support her nomination. She will be filling the role of the member who possesses expertise in telehealth delivery and telehealth system needs. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Are there questions from the committee of uh, Commissioner Johnson? Seeing none, thank you, Commissioner. The chair now recognizes Ms. Danielle Lauder for the purposes of making a statement concerning her nomination. Ms. Lauder? 
Thank you. Uh, Senator Lawrence, Representative Barry, and members of the Joint Standing Committee on Energy, Utilities, and Technology, many thanks for the opportunity to be with you here today. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Danielle Lauder. I'm from Cornville, and I am here to discuss with you my nomination to the Maine Connectivity Authority. If confirmed, I will serve as a representative with expertise in the telehealth landscape. And like my colleagues before me, I'm extremely honored to be considered for this important work to bring equitable and affordable connectivity to all of Maine. I've been involved in telehealth related work here in Maine for nearly 16 years and have served as director of the Northeast Telehealth Resource Center or NETRIC for short since 2014. This federally funded program provides unbiased technical assistance training and other resources to stakeholders throughout all six New England states, New York and New Jersey. As part of this position, I've provided leadership in several Maine based initiatives, including the Maine Telehealth and Telemonitoring Advisory Group and have served as a partner on multiple efforts focused on broadband expansion and digital equity. I've worked closely with hundreds of healthcare organizations and providers to plan, implement, and evaluate telehealth programs throughout the state with a common goal of improving health access and outcomes, particularly for rural and underserved communities. I regularly present and train on a broad variety of telehealth topics on the local, regional, and national level. The NETRIC is a member of the National Consortium of Telehealth Resource Centers. In my role, I lead efforts focused on implementation and growth of telehealth programs throughout the NETRIC region, as well as collaborating on nationwide efforts to advance the reach and impact of telehealth. Regional activities are carried out in partnership with a broad variety of stakeholders, including our largest health systems, many rural hospitals and clinics, colleges and universities who train our healthcare workforce, policymakers, state agencies, and many others. Key efforts include working to advance access and improve health outcomes for rural and underserved populations through innovative models like Project ECHO and assisting health systems and providers to leverage telehealth to address today's crucial health issues, including the opioid crisis, addressing social determinants of health, and more. In my role, I've also assisted many Maine-based organizations to secure funding for telehealth in our broadband projects to meet local needs of residents and communities, including but not limited to funds from the Federal Communications Commission, USDA Distance Learning and Telemedicine Program, Health Resources and Services Administration, and others. As telehealth became a vital tool in maintaining access to care during the early months of the COVID-19 pandemic, including medical, mental health, and substance use disorder services, the network responded to thousands of requests for assistance and resources to help quickly launch telehealth solutions uh, to meet that need. While there was great success in achieving our goals around rapid telehealth implementation here in Maine and beyond, the digital divide that has been a long-term barrier for many became increasingly evident as those living in rural and underserved communities had to forgo or delay care with limited or no broadband available in their homes. While we certainly hope that another public health emergency does not occur, it's vital that we are better prepared for that scenario moving forward and establishing equitable broadband access across all Maine communities is key to that preparedness. As a lifelong Mainer and one who has lived, worked and recreated in rural locations throughout that time, I bring considerable lived experience with respect to the importance of adequate access to internet connectivity across all communities from both personal and professional perspectives. And given my diverse background in public and community health, healthcare, worksite health and wellness, I recognize the opportunities that equitable broadband brings across all sectors and the impact it will have on sustainability and growth for Maine residents and businesses. Maine has led the way on many fronts across history and similarly, I think we can be a leader in leveraging technology to improve the health and productivity of all who live in or visit this great state. I'm passionate about addressing the challenges Maine faces with respect to inadequate bandwidth and the limitations it sets on individual health and productivity, as well as community growth and hope that I'll have the opportunity to contribute to those efforts through the Maine Connectivity Authority. Uh, many thanks again for your time and consideration. Thank you very much. Are there questions? Uh, from any member of the committee of the nominee, Representative Foster. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, Ms. Lauder, for uh, being here today. Congratulations on your nomination. Uh, being a uh, Central Maine uh, uh, longtime resident and now living in Cornville, uh, I hope you appreciate the fact that you'll be representing you know, the most northern uh, nominee for this board, so you've got a little bit of territory to represent. <laughs> Yes, uh, not only in the health area, but uh, uh, having uh, grown up in the area uh, and being, I'm sure, aware of some of the uh, uh, consolidation of our rural hospitals, uh, including Sebastopol, Mayo, uh, the CA Dean Hospital in Greenville. Uh, we're faced with a lot of different challenges up in this area for uh, access to uh, uh, 
not only affordable, but quality health care and some of the resources for uh, physicians and, and uh, those experts in the field for uh, especially our elderly residents, but, uh, but even more so those that live uh, sometimes hours away from the nearest facility that might have those. I'm wondering if you could just touch briefly on how you see your role on this board helping uh, to uh, provide more uh, access for the folks that uh, now, as I say, have to travel sometimes hours to get to a, a facility where they can uh, get the much needed care. Thank you. Absolutely, thanks Representative Foster. Uh, we do a lot of work with Northern Maine, down East Maine. Uh, in fact, we're, uh, we are key collaborators with the Maine Rural Health Collaborative, which includes many of the hospitals that you just mentioned in sharing resources. Uh, telehealth is not the answer to everything, but in scenarios where we can utilize technology, for example, to do pre-op and post-op meet, um, meetings with providers that would literally save folks three hours, six hours, an entire day if they're leaving an island or northern Maine, um, that they don't need to be there in person to make sure that broadband is where it needs to be to ensure that folks can access that either from their home or from a local library in a secure way um, or within uh, their local healthcare facility, but that they can access that specialty care. And there are different modalities of telehealth that can be utilized as well. We're doing live video right now, which takes a little bit more bandwidth and that's highly necessary if we're going to do a specialty consult, et cetera. But there are also other uh, technologies such as electronic consultations, which are more asynchronous in nature that ve take very little broadband. So it's really, I think I bring that scope of understanding which types of telehealth modalities are appropriate for which different types of healthcare, and then also looking at, at the person individually and making sure that they have what they need. Just like in-person care, you have to make sure that you're addressing the individual needs. Do they have the devices? Do they have the connectivity they need? Do they have digital knowledge to use it? If they don't, let's get them, make sure that they have the resources. We've worked with um, Susan Corbett, which who's with the Maine Digital Equity Center um, for many years, and she has wonderful resources. So I also bring all of those connections with folks, not only here in Maine, but if there are other states that are doing some pretty amazing things when it comes to telehealth and or uh, you know, connectivity, I can also bring those in from my connections with those folks. Um, so absolutely, we, we have been working with folks in North Northern and down East Maine, and we very closely understand um, and have helped solve some of the, the um, access issues through telehealth um, throughout the past year. So I hope that answers your question. <laughs> Representative Foster, any follow up? No, thank you. Okay. Any other questions uh, from members of the committee of the nominee? Representative Grohowski? I think we're in a, going in a regular order here <laughs> now. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Ms. Slaughter, for being here and for your interest in this position. I am curious if you have been on other boards, I'm not sure if maybe I missed it, um, or perhaps the main telehealth and telemonitoring advisory group is a, brings, gives you some experience that you could reflect on in terms of what, how you hope to function with this board. Sure, so thanks. I was definitely going to mention that one. That is actually, um, that was a, uh, developed by statute in 2017 um, through the previous administration. And I do serve a leadership role with that, with respect to facilitating bringing uh, partners together, submit the annual reports um, to the legislature that are required, which I know this is that's this will be part of this um, board as well. Um, and I also serve on a number of regional boards, the New York Mid-Atlantic um, Telegenetics Advisory Group. Um, the National Network of Public Health Institutes, which my mothership organization, Medical Care Development, is a member of. Um, I see serve on that leadership board. Um, and as a member of the, our senior management team within Medical Care Development, I serve as a non-voting member of our board, board, and I work very closely with all of our board members to ensure that their extensive expertise and perspectives are integrated into our day-to-day -day work. Um, I don't know how many folks are familiar with MCD, but we have we are a global nonprofit public health organization that's been right in Augusta for 50 plus years. Uh, we're pretty diverse and our, our board is extremely diverse. We have folks in Mozambique, we have folks in rural Maine. So it's it's really pretty incredible. And, and I think um, just my perspective of working with folks of that diverse nature and really making sure that I'm listening. I'm, I'm a, a 
I've taken the, the training for Project ECHO, which if folks aren't familiar with that, it's more of a, um, it's not telehealth, traditional telehealth per se, but it's utilizing technology and video conferencing to build capacity of rural communities and rural providers to um, be able to increase their competencies in, in, um, develop, in delivering care uh, in the primary care setting, particularly in, in rural. And they adopt an all teach, all learn. That's very much my philosophy in life. Everybody who comes to the table has something to teach and they have something to learn. And I really kind of bring that to every, whether it's a board or whether um, it's an advisory group or whether it's day-to-day -day work. I think, you know, that philosophy of mine personally and working with others, um, cultural humility is absolutely another um, strong passion of mine and making sure that whether whatever um, we are looking at, that we're really looking and thinking through the perspectives and how it's going to impact people. Um, serving in and serving both in a leadership role within my organization and also being a person who's passionate about having my boots on the ground and doing project work, which really kind of helps me stay focused and keeping um, my knowledge base in, in, intact and, and growing all the time. Um, I think I bring that perspective as well. So I know how things can snowball and how they can impact things and you know, work in the field or the impact in the field. The decisions that are made, you know, at, at the board level are always going to impact um, the local level. And I, I think I have both based on my work, um, I have a strong understanding of that. Great. Any follow up, Representative Grahowski? Representative Barry? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Ms. Louder, thank you for your willingness to serve um, and for joining us today. Um, I wanted to um, ask you uh, your thoughts about. Uh, because it's come up a number of times, uh, the geographic diversity, um, and you know, I'll throw in other other kinds of diversity, which you know may not be entirely representative. We approve the whole slate that's put forward today. Um, the board, in statute, um, has the ability to choose a secretary and a treasurer and a president, and the president in consultation with the governor, of course, um, that are not necessarily members of the board. So that's a potentially as many as three positions that could be added, if you will, um, to the to the roster. Um, Secretary and Treasurer wouldn't have a vote, uh, but the, the um, you know, the president would be in a very, all, all three would be in a very influential position. Um, it, do you view that as an opportunity to seek uh, greater diversity and, and could we count on you to help to, to um, advocate for that uh, to happen? Absolutely. I think on both points, it is absolutely an opportunity to bring additional diversity in. I think I'm the only woman on uh, this group, so uh, that did, that was not lost to me. Um, so, and additional uh, diversity, whether it be geographic diversity, uh, et cetera, and I would absolutely be willing to um, use my network and, uh, and help advocate for uh, and, and even identify folks who might be willing to serve in those roles. That's great. Thank you. And a follow up, if I may, Mr. Chair. Yes, Representative Barry. Great. Um, I want to ask about affordability. Um, you know, as you know well, that the the social determinants of health are are many, but poverty is a is a huge uh, factor. And um, there are many areas of the state that have technically have access to broadband. There are many homes uh, that have you know, uh, uh, for example, a coaxial cable connection, um, but it's just beyond their financial reach. So to what extent do you think it is, it is uh, worth um, prioritizing affordability? That is in the, you know, on the part of the mission statement of, of the entity, um, you know, even if that means, um, you know, overbuilding or fostering, you know, fostering competition, if you will. Um, do we need to do that? It really drill down on affordability in order to meet the needs of uh, of, of telehealth and and education and and um, other objectives. Absolutely, I think you know Dan Bellier mentioned this with respect to those who need um, ready access to education in order to make sure that they are. Um, making a livable wage and, and better than a livable wage here in the state of Maine and, and that our communities are productive, um, that healthcare is accessible to those who need it most. And if they don't have affordable connectivity, we might as well say, you're right, they don't have access to it. I think it should be 
absolutely a top priority. I'm glad that it's written into um, this, this um, into our mission, um, because without it, I, I think, um, you know, we're just perseverating on the same digital divide that we've had for many, many years. And this is truly an opportunity with, you know, the funds that are coming in. Of course, we're going to build on that. And, and I said before, I think Maine absolutely can be a leader in this area. And I think we wouldn't be doing our job the way that it was intended if we didn't make affordability that very high priority. Okay, thank you very much. Other questions from committee members of the nominee? Seeing none, thank you very much. The chair will now take comments from persons attending this hearing who wish to speak for or against this nomination. I don't see anyone in the attendees with their hand up. Jordan, do we have anybody to speak? There's no one in the attendees list and no one signed up uh, prior to the hearing to testify. Okay. All public comments having been taken, the committee will now proceed as follows. We'll review any written comments on the nomination that have been received by the committee. We will vote on the nomination and uh, report our vote to the Senate pres president of the state Senate. I'll declare the hearing of the Joint Standing Committee of Energy, Utilities and Technology on uh, Ms. Excuse me, Danielle Lauder of Vassalboro for a point, oh, excuse me, I said Vassalboro, I should have said Cornville. Uh, I'm not gonna to apologize to Representative Foster for that. For appointment to the main connectivity authority is closed. In accordance with the law, the committee may not take a vote on the nomination sooner than 15 minutes after the close of the public hearing, unless all committee members present who are present agree. At this time, I'll just ask uh, anyone who does not want to, who um, does want to delay for 15 minutes to raise their hand. Seeing none, we'll proceed directly to the vote in accordance with three uh, MRSA Chapter 16, uh, Section 157, and with the joint rules of the legislature, the vote will be taken by the yeas and nays. The vote of yes will be in favor of recommending, recommending confirmation. A vote of no will be against recommending com uh, confirmation. Is the committee ready for the question? The clerk will call the roll. Thank you. We'll start with Senator Lawrence. Yes. Senator Lawrence is a yes. Senator Vitelli. Yes. Senator Vitelli is a yes. Senator Stewart. Senator Stewart is absent. Representative Barry. Yes. Representative Barry is a yes. Representative Cuddy. Yes. Representative Cuddy is a yes. Representative Grahowski. Yes. Representative Grahowski is a yes. Representative Kessler. Representative Kessler is absent. Representative Ziegler. Representative Ziegler is also absent. Representative Wood. Yes. Representative Wood is a yes. Representative Wadsworth? Aye. Representative Wadsworth is an aye. <clears throat> Representative Grignan? Representative Grignan is absent. Representative Foster? Yes. Representative Foster is a yes. And Representative Carlo? Yes. Representative Carlo is a yes. That is nine in favor, none opposed, four absences. We lose Senator Lawrence. Great, nine members having voted in the affirmative. Um, none, yes. Okay, we can see you now. Can you hear me? Yes. We got it you back. It says I'm unstable right now, so anything could happen. Thank That's you. your broadband, it's not I think it's maybe not I need mind. to take this up with members of the board. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, there's people who would disagree. Nine members. Roll, relocate to Dexter. We have good broadband here. Yeah. Thank you. Well, it's because you have so many members in Northern Maine on this board. Um, nine members having voted in the affirmative and none in the negative and four members being absent. It's the recommendation of the uh, Joint Standing Committee on Energy, Utilities, and Technology that the nomination of uh, Ms. Danielle Lauder of Cornville for appointment to the Maine Connectivity Authority be confirmed. Congratulations. 
Thanks very much to you all. Appreciate You're welcome. it. <laughs> okay, we'll go on to our final uh, nomination before lunch. This is going to be a public hearing of the Joint Standing Committee on Energy Utilities and Technology for the purpose of considering the nomination by the governor of John M. Chandler of Falmouth for appointment to the Maine Connectivity Authority. Pursuant to Title III, Section 157 of the Maine Statutes, which requires there to be an affirmative motion to recommend confirmation of the nominee, the chair recognizes Representative Barry for the purposes of making such a motion. Representative Barry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And <clears throat> I apologize. I once again have not pulled it up. And here we go. Mr. Chair, I move that the Joint Standing Committee on Energy, Utilities, and Technology recommend confirmation of Mr. John M. Chandler of Falmouth for appointment to the Maine Connectivity Authority. Great, a copy of the uh, statutory requirements for this position is available on our website. The chair now recognizes Commissioner Heather Johnson for the purposes of making a statement concerning this nomination. Thank you, Senator Lawrence, Representative Barry, and distinguished members of the Joint Standing Committee on Energy, Utilities, and Technology. My name is Heather Johnson, and I am the Commissioner of the Maine Department of Economic and Community Development. I'm here today on behalf of the Governor to speak in support of the appointment of John Chandler of Falmouth to the Maine Connectivity Authority. John Chandler is a graduate of the University of Southern Maine with a degree in business management and a licensed CPA who has spent the vast majority of his career at Barry Dunn. John began his career at Barry Dunn as a staff auditor with a specialty in the telecommunications industry, developing industry expertise and advising telecom clients on a wide range of issues, including but not limited to rates, revenue design, calling area analysis, separation studies, mergers and acquisitions, financing, and business development strategies. He eventually rose to the principal in charge of the firm's telecommunications and utilities group. As his career progressed, John broadened his work to a variety of industries and clients, including contractors and financial institutions. In 1999, he was named Chief Executive Officer and Managing Principal, a position he held for 22 years. John's combination of financial expertise and experience in the telecom industry will make him a valuable member of the Maine Connectivity Authority. And on behalf of the governor, I urge you to support his nomination. He will be filling the seat that is a member who possesses expertise in banking and financial lending. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Commissioner. The chair would ask if any of the member of the committee has questions of uh, Commissioner Johnson at this time. Seeing none, we'll go on directly to hear from the nominee. The chair recognizes, now recognizes John Chandler of Falmouth for the purposes of making a statement concerning his nomination. Well, thank you. Uh, Senator Lawrence, Representative Barry, and uh, distinguished members of the Energies, Utilities, and Technology Committee. Thank you very much for your service and your time today. Uh, my name is John Chandler. I'm a lifelong Mainer, and I split my time between my primary residence in Falmouth and my hometown of Lovell, which is in fact rural. Um, I am honored to be nominated for a seat on the Maine Connectivity Authority. You know, Maine has a wonderful opportunity to achieve the inspirational goal of universally available high-speed connectivity. Financial resources becoming available recently represent an encouraging down payment. Now we must decide and dedicate ourselves to leveraging and augmenting the instant funds and managing our resources prudently if we were to achieve our overarching goal. We collectively, the authority of the state, local governments and consortiums thereof, community organizations, telecom, providers and other significant stakeholders in healthcare, education, finance, and business must evaluate and pursue avenues to attract additional sources of funding. Potential sources include public and private investments, debt, grants, and revenue from authority investments. Significant work is already being done in Maine on broadband development. We should acknowledge and build upon such experiences and success in a collaborative manner. The authority is well positioned 
to serve as a catalyst and facilitator to frame the questions, find creative and practical solutions and support implementation financially and otherwise. In short, to drive progress toward goal attainment. I am confident we can succeed and energized by the opportunity to lend my expertise and experience to the mission. As uh, Commissioner Johnson mentioned, I'm a graduate of the University of Southern Maine with a Bachelor of Science in Business Management, a certified public accountant with over 34 years of experience in practice. My work has included a wide range of experience from audits of commercial entities, including those in banking and telecommunication industries, to advising clients on appropriate capital structures and assisting them in obtaining financing. I also have experience overseeing investment management gained from serving as the current chair of the investment committee of Freiburg Academy and former treasurer and board chair of the University of Southern Maine Foundation. In addition to my financial background, I have both telecommunications industry and organizational leadership experience. I began my career at Barry Dunn in 1987 as a staff auditor and specialized in telecom, wireless and wireline both. I developed industry expertise and worked with telecommunications clients on a range of issues, including infrastructure financing, mergers and acquisitions, rate cases and other regulatory matters, cost studies and business growth strategies. Having been named principal in charge of the telecom utilities practice in 1995, I led the group until 1999 when I was selected CEO of Barry Dunn, a position I held until June 30 of 2021. Uh, as CEO, I hone my skills in leadership, communication, vision setting, strategic planning, organizational capacity building, talent development, resource allocation, collaboration, and change management. Under my 22 years of leadership, Barry Dunn grew from 175 employees to over 600, and annual revenues increased from 18 million to over 117 million in the uh, fiscal year ended June 20, uh, 30, 2021. Uh, we're projected to have revenues of 130 million for the upcoming fiscal year. Um, I believe my collaborative approach, financial expertise, and successful leadership in business and community organizations prepare me to make a valuable communication to the authority in their incredibly important work. I'm excited for the opportunity to make a difference should I be confirmed. Uh, thank you very much for your consideration. Thank you very, thank you very much, John. Uh, we appreciate it. Um, the chair would ask if any members of the committee have a question of Mr. Chandler at this time. Seeing none, thank you. Oh, Representative Berry, uh, Representative, and then Representative Grahowski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was waiting for Representative Foster and Representative Grahowski, but I'll go first this time. Uh, Mr. Chandler, thank you for uh, your willingness to serve and for your patience with us this morning as we uh, get, work our way through the, the nominees. Um, uh, appreciate your resume. It's very impressive and uh, it's clear that you'll bring um, a great deal to, to this particular position, um, uh, especially with the you know, important expertise in, in banking and financial lending. Um, <clears throat> I want to ask uh, your um, thoughts about the question I asked of Mr. Barrio Nuevo. I'm not sure if you were here at that time, but um, there are a broad range of solutions that have evolved in, in the, in the um, application of, of taxpayer dollars to, uh, you know, broadband solutions uh, here with our, our, our experience with the Connect Main Authority. They range from, uh, you know, full um, municipal ownership to uh, full private ownership. And uh, there are, of course, many permutations in between. Um, I wonder if you can speak to, to your, um, your disposition with, with respect to the, the significant funds that, that will be made available uh, through the main connectivity authority and what, what, are the, what are the best solutions in your view uh, as we go forward um, with that money? Um, thank you uh, for that question. Uh, <clears throat> I, I consider myself a yes and person mm -hmm. because, be, because I feel like um, every, every circumstance has different needs. Mm -hmm. And in order to, to have an equitable solution, which others have, have discussed and I, 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 I feel very strongly about, uh, we need to go where people are, understand their needs and their abilities and try to figure out how to best fulfill those needs with the resources we have available. That's why I focused on augmenting those resources as well, because no one's told me that the amount that we have available is enough. 
Um, and I, and I, I'd like to err on the side of <laughs> caution there anyway. Uh, so when I look at it, the answer could be public, private, combination thereof. The authority could own some infrastructure actually. Um, you know, middle mile kind of stuff. I mean, there's a lot of different ways to look at it. So I'm completely open to solutions because we have our eye on a goal. That's a very important goal. And I am very much driven toward accomplishing goals. And when I look at that, I look at solutions. What are the creative ones? What are the practical ones? What can we get done to realize those goals and lift up the state? Representative Barry, any follow up? Great, thank you. Um, I do have a follow-up question, which is um, uh, perhaps only marginally related. Um, it's, it's really a different question. Um, you're still a partner at Barry Dunn, correct? That is right, I am. And, and in that role, um, uh, th this is part of your financial disclosure. Um, do, you, do you have um, ties in any direct or indirect um, financial capacity to uh, existing poll owners, um, you know, you mentioned that this this entity will have the ability to own polls uh, or existing um, ILEX or, or CLEX for that matter. I have no uh, financial interest in any yeah. other entities than the ones I disclosed. <clears throat> yeah. Um, now, and in, in, well, I will, I think it goes to the conflict of interest question a little bit, which I, I will answer that as, as a CPA, you know, we're objective, we're independent, our standards have that in both fact and appearance. So we're really careful about that. And uh, I've been a, every board I'm on, I'm a gadfly about conflict of interest mm -hmm. because, because I think it's, it's critical to be able to maintain that, to maintain the, uh, the public trust. Mm -hmm. And uh, so just answer a little bit more than the question you were getting at, but um, I hope it gives you a sense of what I'm about. It, it does, and 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 thank you for for mentioning that because my, I'll I'll um, if I may um, end with one final question, Mr. Chair, um, which is um, how, how do you how, how would you advise the board to think about um, sort of secondary conflicts of interest uh, or tertiary conflicts of interest? Where do we where do you draw the line? Because um, you know if if uh, if I'm on the board and I work for a company that has a contract with a company that would be receiving the funds and it's a standing contract, is that in fact a conflict of interest or how would you characterize that? Yeah, I'd, I'd have a tough time answering hypotheticals with respect to that mm -hmm. uh, type of instance. I think we uh, would probably have to have a discussion at the board level up front, right? And, and I've been a big advocate of full disclosure. Mm -hmm. uh, make sure you disclose everything that's potential and then you can have a conversation around it uh, at the board level, where the board member who might have a conflict, potentially even, is, is recused from that and, 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 and the board discusses. And I think a healthy board mm -hmm. can, can manage those very well. Uh, I, I don't have a specific answer to your, your question at hand. I see. Thank you. Representative Grohowski. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and Mr. Chandler for for being here and your interest and your expertise. Um, I appreciate the conversation about your experience on other boards with managing conflict of interest. I think that is really important and I hope that this board will adopt a, a strict and transparent set of policies around that. But um, if you could, as the others have, reflect a little bit more on your experience on boards and how you um, see yourself uh, collaborating and, and contributing to this uh, board just based on other board experience. I'd appreciate that. That's great, thank you. Uh, I learned uh, from my parents to, uh, to serve the community. Um, they did it in public settings. I, I'm, I'm more involved with not-for-profit organizations. And with that, it's you know, my job to make sure that, that the board carries out its responsibilities uh, to steward the organization, to take care of the funds, to make sure that the things are going well um, and that they're meeting their mission. Uh, I work collaboratively with the, with the other members of the board. I, I'm happy to follow. I've been CEO, but, I, but I'm very happy to be a, just a member of the rank and file board members as well. Um, I really appreciate that. And I understand that some of the stresses of leadership and, and uh, wanna do everything I can to help the team be successful. I tend to be the person who maybe brings the alternative perspective. Um, when, when things are all, heads are all nodding, 
I tend to be the person that says, okay, that's, that's good. And um, have we considered X or Y if we're talking about A, B, and C? So it, it's, um, it's a role that I enjoy and I do it without upsetting people. Uh, for the most part, I you know, do it with a little bit of humor and, uh, but, but the point gets across as we're uh, kind of going through stuff because sometimes you can suffer. I don't see this board doing that, but sometimes you can suffer groupthink. So I like to make sure that we're looking at all perspectives and really applying some critical thinking skills to the uh, task at hand. Great, Representative Foster. Thank you, Senator. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chandler for uh, your uh, willingness to serve. Uh, there are many rural miles, uh, you mentioned, uh, between Falmouth and Lovell, many, many more rural miles north and east of there. Uh, I expressed my concerns when this committee discussed the, the uh, bill that uh, led to the formation of this authority in that uh, I've been about trying to make sure every dollar possible goes to stringing fiber. Uh, and I'm sure you're well aware there are uh, there's a lot of need of that throughout the state of Maine, uh, which would require many uh, hundreds of millions of dollars to do it. Uh, my concern was that uh, as we add this, uh, I will call it a bureaucracy for nothing else to, uh, to come up with at the moment, uh, to manage all this, uh, and you being the uh, nominee in the banking financial area of this, I'm wondering if you could uh, help me uh, in understanding how uh, you would work to make sure that as many miles of cable as strong as possible with the dollars available versus uh, uh, maybe wasting some of that, uh, those funds that we have coming our way. Thank you. I, I try not to waste any funds, uh, but, but I, I, I do, I, I appreciate your, uh, your question very much. And I've been dedicated to, um, the early parts of my career, we dedicated to rural telecom and having been involved in, uh, you know, sort of the REA, the RUS funding for my clients and understanding a lot of the grant making and, and, and a lot of the activities that take place on a national level to support rural telecom. Uh, I think there's a lot of opportunity for us to augment our, our funding that we're getting instantly with additional, uh, additional monies that can come to the you know, to help support the rural activities. I think, I think we need to partner with the telecoms. Um, I think it can, it can be done on municipal levels, but there's, there's a bunch of different pieces that have to come together. And that's why we'll have some experts that will talk to you this afternoon about the telecom aspects. But I think there's a lot that can be done. And I think that, um, you know, we, we, with, with the appropriate amount of money and the ability to raise that, we can, we can meet those obligations. I hate to, you know, just, lay down on a particular solution though, because I'm not the telecom expert. I don't, I don't know the answer. Of, I know I have clients that have completely put fiber throughout their networks and largely it's been funded by, you know, federal investment. And there are others who, who have not done that. And I'm just not sure about what all the permutations are at this point, but it's certainly a viable solution to put, uh, put fiber optics out with the money that we have now. Um, you just don't have enough of it. Follow-up, Representative Foster? Yes, just briefly. I, I guess uh, I use that term, stringing fiber, and, and, uh, as a general term. But I think uh, from what I understand from your credentials, uh, what I would be asking is uh, what you bring to the table as far as ensuring that every dollar uh, that comes in is uh, uh, spent wisely that uh, we get the most out of it possible and also access uh, as much uh, funding as possible to go along with that. Um, uh, and, and that's more of my thought. I understand right. that you don't necessarily have the expertise to decide which avenue to, uh, to utilize, but I, I do believe that your role here will be to make sure that the, those members of the board uh, are, are, are finding ways to spend that money wisely. And I guess that's- Right, right. Yeah, so I think that if, if we think about uh, funding gaps, we'll identify funding gap. There's a lot of work that needs to be done. I, I can't suggest exactly where it'll be done in terms of the investment. But as, the, as we prioritize and we work through this, there will be funding gaps. And funding gaps will have different solutions depending on the nature of the community, how much they can commit, or the nature of the you know, the presence of local providers, 
private investment, public investment, but there's going to be these gaps that need to be filled. And so uh, my job would be to drive um, our, our staff, which will have the staff that's, that's very well briefed in, in this process that we should have anyway, and, and just sort of drive them toward those solutions and working with them toward that. The other aspect, which I think is critical and, and needs to be represented on the board is governance and financial stewardship and making sure we have the appropriate accounting mechanisms, the appropriate safeguards to ensure that we're uh, managing the projects and budgeting appropriately and that we're really looking for ways to optimize the dollars that we have available. And that's what I bring to the table will be leadership in that area. Thank you. Pardon me, any follow-up? Any other questions from members of the committee of this nominee, Representative Barry? Thank you, yes, uh, just one additional question, Mr. Chandler, the, um, the slot that you're filling, uh, the, the description reads as follows, um, a member who possesses expertise in banking or financial lending, including but not limited to expertise in the provision of loans or other capital investments for infrastructure deployment in the state. Um, it, is it, help me understand your specific expertise in, um, in doing those things. Is it as an auditor or have you actually provided loans uh, yourself? I'm not a lender. Um, I've audited banks. I've borrowed lots of money um, <laughs> in building, building the company. Uh, but also I've advised clients through their capital structures. I've negotiated financing uh, with, you know, with lenders, uh, both on a, on a local banking level, but also on a national through the uh, rural, finance, uh, rural telephone finance cooperative mm -hmm. and through uh, other you know, sort of co-bank, other, other people have funded telecom investments. So I understand the uh, financial marketplace. I understand what a good deal is and what a bad deal is. And uh, that's, that's really the expertise I bring to the table. I, I've not made loans. Thank you. Any other questions from members of the committee of the nominee? Seeing none, thank you for making your statement. The chair will now take comments from persons attending this hearing who wish to speak for or against this nomination. I do not see anyone in the attendees list who uh, wants to speak. Jordan, do we have anyone? There is no one in the attendees list uh, looking to testify, as you said. Great, all public comments having been taken, the committee will now proceed as follows. We'll review any additional written comments and we'll move to vote on the nomination. The hearing by the Joint Standing Committee on Energy Utilities and Technology uh, for the nomination of John Chandler of Falmouth for appointment to the Maine Connectivity Authority is closed. In accordance with the law, the committee will vote, may not take a vote uh, sooner than 15 minutes after the close of the public hearing unless all committee members who are present agree. Is there anyone who does not agree with taking the vote uh, right away? Representative Barry, Representative Grohowski, you want 15 minutes to caucus? Okay, um, so uh, we'll take a break, we will caucus, and then uh, we'll come back. I'll ask Representative Barry to uh, conduct the vote as I have a meeting to go to um, during lunch, and then we'll be back at two o'clock uh, for the uh, remaining nominees. Mr. Chair, I need to uh, mention as well. I, I have uh, an engagement at 1.30, so we'll, we'll, we'll take the vote and then uh, be gone during that time. All right, with that, uh, you can uh, uh, stop your video and mute. We will return at uh, 1.23 on the dot.
Okay, welcome back. And if folks could turn their video on again, we'll begin when we have a quorum. Seth, I'm here for Mark Lawrence. I'm here for the quorum. Just let me know when the vote comes. Okay, will do. Thank you, Senator. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, we do have seven since uh, Senator Lawrence <clears throat> is still with us. Uh, we have a quorum, seven and a Senator. And so the pending question before the committee is that the Joint Standing Committee on Energy Utilities and Technology recommend to the Senate of the 130th Maine Legislature that the nomination of Mr. John M. Chandler of Falmouth for appointment to the Maine Connectivity Authority be confirmed. And in accordance with 3 MRSA Chapter 6, Section 157, and with the joint rules of the 130th Legislature, the vote will be taken by the yeas and nays. A vote of yes will be in favor of recommending confirmation. A vote of no will be against the motion to recommend confirmation. Is the committee ready for the question? And I see Representative Grahowski wishes to be acknowledged. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to say mm -hmm. thank you, uh, Mr. Chandler, for um, putting yourself forward, for being willing to serve. Um, I think you have a lot of incredible um, expertise and commitment to the state and its goals. I am, however, concerned separately that I'm struggling to see um, how your background and experience fits actually into the statutory requirements. So I am intending to vote against this, but not because I don't think you will do a phenomenal job on the board, but because I, I do think that there's a, I, I don't see the interpretation here as being um, accurate to this, the statute that I um, voted for on this committee and in the house. Is there anyone else on the committee uh, wishing to make a statement before we proceed to a vote? Okay, seeing none, the committee clerk will call the roll. Thank you. We'll start with Senator Lawrence. Yes. Senator Lawrence is a yes. Senator Vitelli? Senator Vitelli is absent. Senator Stewart? Senator Stewart is also absent. Representative Barry. Yes. Representative Barry is a yes. Representative Cuddy. Yes. Representative Cuddy is a yes. Representative Grahowski. No. Representative Grahowski is a no. Representative Kessler. No. Representative Kessler is a no. Representative Ziegler. Representative Ziegler is absent. Representative Wood. Yes. Representative Wood is a yes. Representative Wadsworth. Yes. Representative Wadsworth is a yes. Representative Grignan. Representative Grignan is absent. Representative Foster. Yes. Representative Foster is a yes. And Representative Carlo. Yes. Representative Carlo is a yes. That is seven in favor, two opposed, four absences. Thank you, Jordan. Seven members of the committee having voted in the affirmative and two in the negative. It is the vote of the Joint Standing Committee on Energy Utilities and Technology that the nomination of Mr. John M. Chandler Falmouth for appointment to the Maine Connectivity Authority be confirmed. Uh, the vote of the full Senate uh, will be on Monday the 19th. And Mr. Chandler, um, congratulations uh, on the positive vote. And thank you uh, again for, for joining us and being willing to commit your time and uh, expertise to what comes next. Thank you, my pleasure.
Great. Okay, and with that, uh, <clears throat> it being almost 1.30, we will break for half an hour for lunch. Uh, we'll come back at two o'clock, uh, Senator Lawrence indicated, uh, to hear the remainder of the nominations and to vote on those. Um, so if you could uh, just turn off your video. I did actually want to jump in there because there are two Zoom, there's a Zoom meeting set up for this morning, which we're on currently, and there is Got a it. separate Zoom set up for this afternoon and the remaining Thank you. nominees. So this Zoom meeting will be closing, but I can be sure to resend the Zoom link so everyone has that. That's great. Um, Thank you, Jordan. Go. Thank you for that uh, reminder. Great, so in that case, you can actually leave this meeting. And um, Jordan, will you have a, a screen for the general public to, to throw up for half an hour? Um, it'll, just it it'll just be down. Okay, that's fine. So hopefully the, folks- The YouTube page has, a, has like an upcoming live stream. Okay. So it should be all set. Excellent. Yep. All right, have a good lunch, everyone.